to our viewers from Facebook. Welcome. Uh, you are joining a part of the Community COVID Action Summit hosted by New England Complex Systems Institute and ncoronavirus.org. Today, we are featuring some of our researchers from Nexi, Ola Bushel, Layla, and Blake Ellis. We'll give you guys a few more minutes just to sign on and sign in here on our Zoom and our Facebook. And we will start with Ola and Leela. Yes. Can I, should if I share? Would, if you would like to share screen, you can start your presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, I will do it right now. Can you see? It's blank. Can you see it now? It's still blank. You might have to select a different um, screen. Do you want to stop okay. sharing and try again? Okay, yes. Let me try it again. Um, can you see it? No? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for listening to our presentation. This is a project that, that awarded with NSF, granted with NSF, and titled Strategizing COVID-19 Lockdowns Using Mobility Patterns. My colleagues on this uh, project are Olha Bushel and Yenir Varya. Um, we would like to, uh, uh, here we would like to show that uh, mobility, to show that uh, the state governments must collaborate with each other as the states are not necessarily disconnected from each other uh, based on the mobility uh, patterns. We would like to create an opportunity to uh, optimize, lock, uh, optimize lockdown strategies by aligning policy with individuals' mobility patterns. Uh, there are a combination uh, of uh, three important factors in the spread of an infectious disease. Uh, like transmissibility of the pathogen responsible for the infection, incubation time period of the disease, and host heterogeneity in both population and social interaction characteristics. In this project, we focus on the third uh, factor that I'm presenting here, and showing that how it can be, uh, it can change or help us to control the spread of the disease. Uh, it's challenging to predict and control the an outbreak due to the complexity of human interactions and movements uh, on different, to the different location and also the population density, the heterogeneity in the population density. In the US, the federal government defines the general policies and do the budget allocation and the state governments are responsible for implementing the policies. Each state government acts separately with most of the measurements and risk definitions being done by administrative patches and borders. Special distancing and quarantine policies have been the most important uh, impactful policies on controlling the diffusion of a disease, especially the COVID-19. So there is a critical need to carefully define the borders of areas with different risk levels considering the location of suspected cases. We need to know where the people who were in touch with the infected person were and went. To find an answer for these uh, critical questions, we uh, collected the mobility data and did some analysis to define that where people mostly spend time. In the next slide, my colleague Olga, who is responsible for the data uh, gathering and collecting and doing the analysis, is explaining about the data and the methods. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Hi, yes, we can. Okay, uh, so for this data, uh, for uh, this project, we are using SafeGraph's uh, data. SafeGraph is um, a company, as a data company, data provider uh, that um, has several data sets. Uh, they, uh, for this project, we are using social distancing data, uh, data set. 
uh, that uh, collects mobility data extracted from smart, uh, uh, smartphone applications. Uh, the, uh, this data set gave us an opportunity to explore the evolution of um, mobile communities uh, during COVID-19. Uh, it's all US based data. Uh, social distancing data set uh, uh, captures human movement in geographic space. Each person who moves in space and uses social media for communication leaves some footprints in the form of um, geospatial coordinates. If we take many paths li uh, like uh, this, we can construct uh, and um, get insights about mobility patterns in the area. If we take uh, paths uh, around, from around the world, we can construct uh, uh, the, map, uh, the mobility map of the world. Uh, to anonymize mobility data, uh, safe, safe graph uh, doesn't give uh, the path of uh, each individual. Rather, it gives connections between uh, different uh, uh, census block groups. So it uh, aggregates data at the level of census block groups and then provides relationships between census block groups. So it's impossible to uh, reconstruct uh, uh, where, uh, where uh, a person who lives in one census block group and where, uh, where he goes and what he does, uh, does during the day. So it's safe, it's safe from uh, the point of view of um, uh, po uh, policies. Uh, but on the other hand, it gives us an opportunity to uh, construct communities from these movements where people live, uh, where people go and wh what they, uh, they do uh, throughout the day. Uh, the data set has uh, relationships between block groups, weights, and dates. Uh, we can uh, infer information about sources, uh, so, uh, the so, uh, source, uh, uh, the beginning of the movement, the target, uh, the target of the movement, and the weights. Daily data frames are later combined into uh, we uh, weekly data frames, uh, and uh, uh, their uh, uh, weights are summed. Weekly data frames uh, allow us to see uh, see better patterns about data. Uh, next slide, Leila, please. Um, the social uh, distancing data set um, we are using for constructing the mobility network. In the mobility network, nodes represent um, uh, uh, census block groups. Census block groups uh, are um, uh, smaller than uh, census tracts, and uh, they are larger than census uh, census blocks. So they are uh, they are in the middle. Uh, edges represent the movement of an indivi of individuals between uh, uh, the census uh, census block groups. Uh, edges weights represent the number of people who travel between the two census uh, census block groups. Uh, the current slide shows um, uh, the degree distribution in one of our mobility networks. You can see uh, that census block groups with the higher degrees are located in densely, po in densely populated locations. Network allows us to analyze the presence of communities. Specifically, we apply the Luovine algorithm and modularity of optimization to the mobility network. Communities refer to regions in which nodes are more connected to each other than the rest of the network. We run community detection algorithm at, uh, three times for each time frame. Uh, during uh, the first round, we detect large main communities. Then we select uh, relationships uh, within each large community and detect sub sub communities. And finally, we select relationships among sub communities, filtering out communities inside the communities and detect mega communities. Mega communities are used. Olga? Olga, it looks like we lost your sound. Okay, I, I, I can continue if she can. Okay. Okay. So uh, mega communities are uh, showing the, the relations between the communities. 
in the first level. So let me show you the result of the, uh, these uh, maps that we created, these networks. First of all, mobility patterns can be characterized in three overarching concepts. Short distance movements that can happen, that happens for grocery shopping or walking, people going around near their home. Medium distance movements that travel to neighborhood cities for job or for fun. And long distance movements that people travel to other cities for vacation or visiting families. Um, a combination of these habits in a self-organized manner form the size and the borders of these communities and also allow us to do the multi-scale uh, analysis and define the, the, the communities in different scales. Uh, in different scales. So let me show you the, how we build and what is the result. Here I showed the communities for uh, the map in uh, April 5th to 11. Uh, and uh, the communities are shown with different colors and mega communities are shown with color hue and uh, sub communities that is detected inside the, uh, the communities are so divided from each other by uh, black lines. You can see that we have uh, five large mega communities in the US that in most of the weeks they are in the same uh, number but maybe the borders are changing sometimes uh, that are very important and we can interpret them during the uh, weeks but the important thing is that we always see mega communities in the east north north in the west north east uh, northeast uh, south uh, east and in the south of the us showing that how people mostly spend time in those areas. But the important thing is that, uh, as you can see here, the state boundaries are shown with the yellow line and uh, county borders also in this uh, uh, slide showed with the yellow lines. So, uh, you can see that, however, in some of the areas, uh, borders of the communities are aligned with the uh, administrative borders in most of the areas they are strongly deviate from those borders. That's why we believe that it's important that the state governments collaborate with each other as states are not necessarily disconnected. Um, by putting the number of the COVID cases on top of the map of the communities, we can define the risk of exposure for each of these communities in different locations. And by monitoring these changes over time, we can show that which areas having a high, uh, are in higher risk than the other areas. Let me uh, zoom into, the uh, into these maps and uh, see some of the very interesting uh, facts of these maps. First of all, if in a large community, in a larger scale, we see a community with higher number of cases, when we go to the smaller communities and sub-communities in those communities, we can see that some of the communities are in higher uh, risk than the other communities. And this means that we, can, we don't need, really need to uh, behave all of, these uh, all of these regimes with the same uh, policy. Uh, areas that they have a lower number of cases uh, they can, they are safer areas and they are have the opportunity to get open earlier than the areas that they have a higher number of cases. Also, you can see that in the areas, in the city areas, size of the communities are getting smaller, but when we go to the uh, suburban area, they are getting longer. So means that people in the suburban area, they are uh, moving to the longer area, uh, longer distances. Um, we have some different communities as well. One of them are isolated communities. Some parts of a community can be geographically disconnected from the origin communities. These communities are very important because they can be the source of the spread of disease from one uh, area to another area. Universities are a, a good example of these type of communities. Here I show Cornell and Sunny uh, Cornell universities that they are located in the New York state, but they are connected to the New York uh, city community. And uh, the, uh, if you notice this uh, map is for April 5th to 11, when we had a lot of uh, high uh, number of cases in New York city. 
and the students in those uh, universities are mostly coming from the, those uh, that, uh, that city. So that's very important. And the other one are vacation at spots. We realize that uh, vacation at spots can be uh, disconnected from the origin city, showing that where people in the, in the, in for instance in the in those communities spend time. Here, Catskill Mountain is uh, an area or regime that people in New York City mostly spend time for vacation there, and also Pakuns is a community a sub community that people in uh, South New Jersey spend time there as a vacation spot. The other ones are sub communities within other sub communities. There are some uh, some uh, areas or sub communities that people in them mostly prefer to communicate with each other uh, rather than the uh, suburban area, uh, and the uh, surrounding area. Um, university campuses are a good examples of these kind of uh, communities that I showed here. Two of them, and the other one are, uh, is that we can see the sub communities in city areas racial and income differences um, transportation or uh, structures in the cities uh, infrastructures in the cities can be the so, uh, the reason of having these sub communities inside the city areas showing that people in those uh, areas of the city mostly spend time in that in a, in a small area than the other areas the other interesting uh, fact from these maps is that we realize that, however, these communities showing where people mostly spend time, but they are not really disconnected from each other. They have some relation to the other communities uh, that people go from other communities to those ones or people from that community go to the other ones. These are very important for, uh, to understand the, the spread of the disease in the larger scale, how where people uh, going and how they spread the disease to other communities. For instance, here I, I show an, a community in New York City. Uh, however, you can see that many of the uh, movements from that community or uh, to the, from other communities to that community is from surrounding uh, from communities, but you can see that there are a lot of movements from that community to the communities in Florida state. And again, this is the map in the, the time that we had a lot of cases in New York City, and that's why we expect to have a lot of uh, cases later in uh, Florida that happen uh, in reality as well. So in, at the last, by uh, checking these communities, uh, over time, we can see that how these maps, uh, how these uh, communities are changing, how locked and policies changing the patterns, how much they were impactful. And uh, here I showed, uh, for instance, six weeks that are showing the, the maps from February to May. And you can see that how they are changing. There are, we can re re recognize a lot of or extract a lot of information from these maps, but I try to just explain and mention two of them. First of all, we realized that when we go from February to May, at the beginning we had many isolated communities that are for, they were far from the origin community, but in May those areas started disappeared, meaning that many of the long distance movements get. Uh, limited by the lockdowns. The other one is that if you take a look in February, uh, Florida states, uh, communities in Florida states are getting connected, uh, were connected to the uh, northeast of uh, area of the US to the uh, communities in that area, showing that it was a vacation spot for the people in that area. During the March, it's getting connected to the community in the west of the US and just, um, in April and after that, it's getting disconnected from those communities, meaning that finally in April, they could could really impact full lockdowns and helping people in those areas to get disconnected from the long distance movements. And, but we already had the, a lot of cases in that time for the, uh, for the Florida state. But anyway, these, uh, I want to mention that these, these maps can help us to realize a lot of different things from the uh, what's going on in the US and we hope we can by these maps and tracking all of these things uh, um, and update the maps, 
we can help policymakers to realize how uh, lockdown strategies are working and how the communities or mobility patches are uh, changing over time. Thanks for listening to our presentation. And we are uh, welcome to the volunteers and uh, more collaboration on this work. Thanks for listening. Awesome. Thank you so much, Leela and Olga. That was really interesting. Um, do we have some messages of or questions in the chat? Chris Miller says, a national COVID cabinet in Australia has helped state governments to cooperate. They have a history of worrying, rather collaborating with each other and the federal government here. Thanks for a great presentation, brilliant work. Um, does anyone have any questions before we move on to Blake? No? All right. Well, we will turn it over to Blake with his ec economy and COVID intervention demonstration. This is going to be really interesting. I know you guys have been working on this for a long time. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Katie. Um, so before I show slides, I just want to say a couple things. Um, what we're doing is clearly suboptimal. Okay, we can start with that, that we see that this pandemic is going way further than we ever hoped or ever wanted. Um, and so the question that I think we need to ask is, why are we not doing things that we think we maybe should be doing? And, and one way we can look at this is, uh, there have been clear concerns and disagreements over uh, economics and, and sort of how economics and health play together. And, and so, my goal in this talk is to convince you that there is no trade-off between economics and health. Um, this might be obvious to, to some people, um, but I think for there's still enough disagreement that is worth talking about and worth asking, how did we get to a place where even if this was a false, uh, a red herring, that we still got caught in that and for that reason ended up taking uh, worse action than we might otherwise have done. Um, so let me let me now share. Okay, and I should mention this is joint work with um, the researchers at Nexi. Um, so, so again, you know, there's this question of are health and economics opposed? Is this a zero sum game that we're playing? And you know, some people might think of this as COVID as a trolley problem. Uh, if we're familiar from you know philosophy and, and things like this, uh, you know, a trolley is rolling down a track and it's uh, it's destined to hit these people, but you have a lever and you can turn to hit this person instead. Uh, those are your only two choices, uh, you know, what do you do? Uh, and, and so you can imagine, well, okay, this, you know, maybe it was headed towards the COVID patients, but you have an option of sort of uh, sparing some patients, but in the process you have to sacrifice uh, everyone else's welfare, right? Closing businesses and so forth. Um, and so is that a thing you should do? And, and what I'm gonna try to show is that this is the wrong way to be thinking about it. Um, and, and we'll get to why that's the case. But, you know, I think, I think that this is like a big reason why, you know, these two groups have been kind of arguing with each other. Some people want to save these folks, some people want to save those folks. And I, I think that's where a lot of the tension has come in. Um, now, of course, we have this also. <laughs> we have some people saying this is the real trolley problem. And this is from last April, saying that uh, it's actually just a trolley running over people all the time. And you can stop it at any point. But uh, disrupting the trolley would cause the company to lose uh, lose profits. Uh, we of course have a reassurance that every four years we can paint the trolley red or blue. <laughs> but but uh, jokes aside, so I, I decided to look at something. 
I decided, I first asked myself, what would an AI do? It, okay, if we had sort of a computerized algorithm running things and sort of choosing the optimal strategy, what would be just an objectively optimal thing to do? And, and so I decided to train two different algorithms. Uh, uh, one that says, I want to have as few cases as possible. Just don't get people sick. Okay, and what does that look like? Well, it's pretty, pretty simple. You can even just draw this curve. Uh, you don't have to use a computer. And, and you can just say that if whatever cases I'm starting with, I'm just gonna do the strictest lockdown I can until I get down to zero cases and, and I'm finished and I, I don't even reopen. Okay, so this is the level of lockdown, uh, the R parameters, this reproductive number. Uh, let's just keep R below one forever. Okay, and then we'll never have cases. That's, that sounds good, except you're paying a very large cost to do that. And, uh, you know, so it's not taking cost into account. Then I trained another algorithm where I did take cost into account. And, and so here, so I included two sources of cost. I included a cost of a person getting sick because that person has a chance of dying and um, even going to the hospital. Uh, th these are all things that cost. Uh, and, and so it's a cost to the economy, but it's also a cost to that person and uh, that, person's, that person's welfare and what they're willing, the way they measure like the cost of a life. And this is important, right? There, there is a cost of human life. Uh, in the US it's valued at around $10 million. Um, you can argue over that number. And I think all of a sudden everyone's a, a philosopher and they wanna argue about the value of, of life. But um, it turns out we've had to do this for a very long time. We've had to set speed limits on highways. Uh, we've had to make other public safety decisions where lives are at stake. And, and so you, there are ways that you can compute this number of uh, people value their life this much. You know, you have to pay someone this much to do a dangerous job. Right, to, to be a construction worker or something. So, so we know how much people value their life. Um, we can also estimate the cost of locking down, which would be how much, how much of the economy do you think you'll lose by, by doing a lockdown? And so, so I estimated these two things and we can get into, we can get into what those estimates look like. Um, but the point is when you include these two sources of cost and you now ask the computer, what should I do to minimize those costs? it comes up with something a little more interesting, but not that different, not that different from what's over here. The only difference, you still lock down very hard in the beginning. This is an R equals 0.5 lockdown that, that it shows. Uh, but then as you approach zero cases, you slowly reopen. And if you're at zero and you're open, nothing will happen until you import a case uh, because your borders might be open. And so if that happens and you have to lock down again, and so this, this thing, you know, wants to be open. It tries opening, unlike, uh, unlike this, but it tries opening and it finds uh, new outbreaks coming and it shuts down again. Uh, okay, so that's, that's the key difference in, in trying to preserve the economy when you can, reopening as much as you can safely. Okay, safely. But, but the point is that these two graphs look almost the same. It's almost noise. And so, the, you know, that seems like where we should be, not, uh, well, only a couple countries have achieved something like this, but not like the, what the rest of the world is doing. And, and so the question is, what is the rest of the world doing and what are what is being optimized? And I think that's a question we really haven't asked or, or pressed to get answers on was what are we actually trying to do? Um, but so the structure for the rest of this talk is I wanna make an argument and the argument will come in three points. The first point is that these two objectives that I named, those are really the only two objectives that we might reasonably care about. Saving lives or saving some bigger notion of welfare, not just deaths, but, but sort of welfare of the public itself, which I'm measuring as an economic uh, quantity. And I'll talk a little bit so about why these are the only two things. And you know, there's not some third thing that we might have like, uh, yeah, there's not some third thing that we, we should be thinking about. It's really just one of these two. And I'll argue that B is a good choice, but uh, we can have questions about that as well. But if those are the only two objectives, then the next part of the argument says that, well, what I just showed you, and I'll put more details into that, but that you get a similar answer. You get a similar answer for uh, either of these two objectives in terms of what plan you should have. 
And so from those two things, you know, the, th the third point, the conclusion is the only strategies we should be considering are those that achieve elimination. And so, so if you believe one and two, you're, you're gonna get out three as an answer. Um, we can consider one as the why, you know, and I think, so yesterday we had some great, great talks yesterday. Um, and there was one tip about really how, how science should be communicating to the public. And, and that too often we get stuck in the what, you know, we, we really have these ideas about what to do and, and how to do things, but starting with the why, I think, you know, I agree is a great, um, is, is an important place to start. Uh, we can consider, consider then in two, right? So this is why we're doing it, it's because we wanna save lives or it's because we wanna save the economy. Two is the how, it's what are do we need to achieve? That's really what it comes down to. It's what growth rate or elimination rate do we want? And then the what, the what would be, well, okay, what policies do we implement to, to do this? What do we close? What do we open? I'm not gonna talk about this actually. Uh, in much detail, because the point is that it doesn't matter that much um, which things we do as long as they achieve this elimination strategy. Um, you know, you know what actions might do it? Well, there's, there's quite a lot of choices, but the reason we don't have to talk about them so much is just because we have a checklist and it's been well studied sort of what these, um, you know, what each of these things actually does. There's a nice calculator we can, you know, we can go look at. Um, and as you check and uncheck, you know, oh, I want to add, uh, you know, I want to suspend some businesses. Okay, that's going to change your R by some amount. Uh, and so, if I if I say, well, I want my R to be one. Okay, I want to keep cases flat. Well, then I just need to pick which boxes achieve that. And there might be multiple choices, different ways to do it. And I say, fine, give me the cheapest one. I don't care. <laughs> okay, I don't care. Um, and so we're just going to ask, what what would it cost to achieve some R? Whatever the cheapest way is to achieve some R, that's what we'll do. And the question then really is what R should we go for? So we can sort of eliminate this what aspect and just ask you know, really like what R do we need? And that's the how. And by achieving that R, we'll get to sort of these outcomes. So let's go deeper into a couple points on each of these. So why, why would we only care about lives or the economy? Uh, I think it's important to say this because if we try to argue about policy, we might get into these roundabout situations where it's like, well, maybe I care about something else. Like maybe I care, you know, if I'm a politician, I'm trying to get elected. Uh, so I care about votes. Maybe that's my met metric of success is, well, did people vote for me? Am I popular? But, you know, but what I'll argue is that if you do well for the economy, that's, how you become popular, right? That's that's what people want, is they want money in their pocket, they want a good standard of living. Um, and, you know, there's there's one point here about, um, I don't have a slide for it, but I'll just, just pause here. You know, if we, if we say, okay, we can maximize the economy, one point to be careful of is always that, who are you helping? You know, so some people might see more of that benefit than others. Uh, the economy can grow, but it may not reach everybody. And the answer to that is just redistribution. Because if you grow the pie, right? If you grow the pie, then you can give everybody a bigger slice. If you shrink the pie, someone has to get a smaller slice. And so what we're doing right now in this pandemic is we're all fighting for our slice of a shrinking pie, right? The whole ship is just sinking and we're trying to sort of get a climb to the top of the Titanic as it sinks. Uh, and so, so it's jockeying for a position on this, this really sinking mission. Whereas if you grow the pie, if you grow the economy as a whole, you at least have an opportunity to redistribute and give everyone a better share. Um, and so again, you know, I'm not getting into the what, how would we redistribute, but, but the point is that you can do it when the pie is bigger and you can't do it when it isn't. And so, so maximizing the economy like is a good thing and gives you the opportunity to make everybody better off. And so therefore, everyone should vote for you if they're sort of rational in their thinking. Now, they might be deceived, right? There, there's other ways that people don't vote for what's in their best interest. And that's, you know, but as a politician, you know, I don't think you'll want to aim to deceive people to get votes. You want to aim to actually give people what's really better for them. And so if you do that, you know, that should be the way to build long-term trust in government 
is, is to have people actually feel that they're getting what they need rather than sort of fickle um, popularity contests. So, so I've argued that we should really, you know, economy is a good thing to do. Um, now we should get into how do we actually, how do we do it? Uh, and this is the meat of sort of the, the analysis I've done. Um, so I talked, about, I talked about the costs that are involved. Um, we'll get a little bit more into what things cost and what benefits we can achieve. So the first thing you have to know is that how a disease spreads. You know, if you know how many people are infected, current cases, and you know this reproductive number, along that, along with the importation rate, those three things tell you how many cases you'll have in say a week. Uh, and this is a simplification, but it's, you know, it's pretty reasonable um, in terms of making broad scale choices that we're interested in. And so, okay, that's great. Um, but we, so the thing that we're gonna get to change is this reproductive number. Um, but how should we change it? Well, the more infections you have, the more that's gonna cost you. Uh, as I said, there's a cost of the human life. We can approximate it around $10 million, but um, so, so I, I, I did this calculation where there's, uh, there's a chance of death, you know, say it's about 1% if you're infected, maybe more, maybe less. There's a chance that you go to the hospital, maybe that's 10% given that you're infected. Um, and so you can add up these probabilities, you can add up the costs of each of those things. A hospital visit will cost you about $50,000. It's the average, right? This is the order of magnitude that we're going for. Uh, but the point is the more cases you have, the more it will cost you. If you exceed hospital capacity, now it's gonna cost you even much more, okay? Because more people will die. Uh, and so, so we have a notion of what it will cost to have infections, but it also costs something to reduce infections. So if I wanna get R very low, I have to spend you know, quite a lot of money and the scales of these axes are, are relative. So we see that, you know, we're asking, well, okay, if I wanna get R down to one, that's about the same as maybe a hundred cases per day. Um, it's about that same cost, okay? Which is kind of reasonable. You can think about, you know, I'm not gonna shut down if, if only one person is sick, but if a hundred people are sick, you know, that's sort of maybe uh, that's enough, okay? But these are all estimates and so, you know, I, I accounted for, well, maybe we need to, maybe I underestimated, maybe it actually costs three times more. So, so we tested a few of these different possibilities. It turns out that the answer we get, the answer we get does not depend so much on uh, these choices of parameters. And, and this is the notable thing, is that I can make these costs almost whatever I want within reason. I mean, you know, you do check things out where the GDP of the US is 20 trillion a year and you know, maybe we'll lose half our economy if we shut down or something like this. So you can do a sanity check that it's, it's in the right ballpark. And then over that ballpark, we tested a, a bunch of different values and see whether or not the answer changes. Uh, and it mostly, mostly doesn't. Um, so that's, that's our model. And so we can sum these two costs, the cost of the cases plus the cost of the lockdown. And you now get this total cost. And the task now is to um, optimize over time you're summing these costs. So at every time step, you have a new choice to make. Um, I'll show a little animation of this. I think maybe I have a couple more minutes to show sort of, you know, the, there's a sort of game that you can play here. Um, and some collaborators with N coronavirus, we, we built this game or this uh, simulator where you actually have choices. So you start with some number of cases and I'm gonna close business, close schools. And ooh, I still have a lot of cases. Uh, I'll try closing some more things. Ooh, great. Okay, going down, going down. And so you can sort of add up, well, I spent this much money and I achieved this many cases. And, and so you, as a policymaker, this is kind of what you're playing with and trying to ultimately get this cost as low as you can. Um, and here by not locking down early enough, we, we cost ourselves a lot. Whereas if we had say, if we had say closed earlier, You know, there's still a cost. We, we definitely paid something, but this is about half uh, of what it was before, um, right? So again, you know, kind of just ballpark estimates of things to get a sense of how it works. Um, I think I have a couple more minutes. So let me, let me show you some of the other results. Um, oh, 
Okay, so we solve it and we get something like this, as I showed before. You actually just go almost to zero. And the only reason it doesn't stay at zero is because you have some importation. Um, now, at some point, if we turn the importation up enough, we'll see that it, it actually gives up and it, it stops trying. But for this was, I think, one case every other day. So it's quite a lot um, that was being imported. And remember, these are the cases I actually didn't say this. These are the cases that get past border control. OK, so, so I'm sort of not counting that if your border control can stop the cases, then that's actually the best. And so zero is, is quite possible if you're doing that border check. Remember, New Zealand you know, has gone many months, and other countries also have gone many months with it, zero community cases. And so that's really what I'm talking about here is the community cases. Um, so if they can go a country of 5 million with only a community case every few months, uh, this I simulated in a population of uh, 10,000, and I had a case every two days. So it's definitely it's quite a high level of import, and still it decides to eliminate. Um, so I, I did vary this, right? So here, over time, the policy changes. Uh, but depending how many cases you have, if you tell me, okay, I have 80 cases, and it's day 12, then I'm going to tell you, okay, you are red. You need to lock down. Uh, if you have 28 cases, well, okay, you can kind of open a bit, but not that much. If you have zero, you're in this green, you can reopen. And I put an end time on it here. So the vaccine is coming <laughs> at some point and maybe everyone's just vaccinated, which won't happen right away. But, but if it did, if it did, then okay, as you get close to that date, you can reopen quite a lot. But before then you really can't. And so all this time, all these months are passing uh, and we're not close to 100% vaccinated, it means that we're still here, okay? We're not, we're not here yet. As I said, if you import more, then that does change things. If you're importing every other day, uh, you actually will give up to some extent, to some extent. Um, but you, know, you, you can do a lot of things to prevent that from being the case. Um, and even in this case, right? It, the white band ends up being here. So it's kind of gonna level off at 12. It's not gonna just let it be hundreds. Okay, so we end up getting something usually very much like this, uh, not like this. What we don't, what we, so what we don't see, or what we don't see is just kind of letting it go for months on end. Um, uh, under any parameter that we tried, under any objective that we gave it to optimize for, we just never see it do this. And so the question is what objective do we as a society have and why are we doing things this way? Um, okay, we don't see this either. Um, well, that's sort of a good good attempt, uh, but we're always seeing something like this. So um, as I talked about, you know, as more people get vaccinated, that so now I have, you know, a third get vaccinated early and then a third, another third and, and then the remainder. As that happens, you definitely can relax more. Um, now, if you start early enough though, the vaccination won't matter you start early enough, you'll actually just eliminate before the vaccination becomes relevant. And that's a good thing. Now you might say, well, I didn't do that. Okay, I, I'm over here now. And, you know, what should I do? The answer is, well, you should still eliminate. And, you know, you'll still make it in time. But you say, I didn't do that either. Now I'm over here. Now it's actually getting to be too late. And so and so you can end up in this position where there actually now is a trade off. There actually now is a reason to economically let things just open and you will get some more cases. Uh, but you're anticipating this, uh, you're anticipating this light at the end of the tunnel, which we hopefully get to, but we can't even guarantee that. But you know, in the optimistic case, so that's the one place where you could get this trolley problem. Uh, economics pushes you this way, whereas health would push you this way. Um, and so the hope is that we don't put ourselves there. Uh, the hope is that we sort of land the plane smoothly and make it under that white band rather than crash landing into it and then being forced uh, forced sort of the wrong way. Um, so that's sort of, that concludes the argument. Um, and I'll just say that th there are implicit beliefs going on, which is that if you think that elimination is not worth it, it means you think that one of these assumptions was wrong. And, and I think that what we need to do when we communicate science, and this is really a step beyond science because we're not just asking we're not just asking well what's true about the world right what 
what parameters are true. What we're asking is what should we do? Okay, and so if you think we should do something different, you must think one of these things, either that, sorry, either that the cost of infections is much lower than I said it was, right? That people don't die or something. Uh, maybe you think the lockdown is much more expensive than I claimed. I claimed it was about half of our economy at most. That seems to be what the GDP numbers of every country has been. It's not, you know, it's not like much more than that. In fact, it's much less. Um, or you think that your hospitals can handle a whole lot more, right? So I had that, that point where you exceed hospital capacity and, and it's, um, you're spending much more, but maybe you think that capacity will save you. Maybe you think that uh, the importation rate is just so high and you can't lower it. So you must think that one of these things is true. And so my question for, as we try to communicate and, and sort of engage in civil discourse, uh, I think the question we should be asking sort of opposition to our, to this point of view is, well, which assumption do you disagree with and, and how wrong were we, right? Maybe our numbers are a bit off, but are they off by, you know, 10 times or five times? I mean, and how much is that gonna change our actual decision? Um, so this is really not so much a science question as much as an engineering question. I think we've been taught to listen to the science, obey the science. And the problem again is that science is about asking uh, how the world works. Engineering is about asking how do we make the world work the way that we need it to work, the way that we want it to work. Uh, and so I think rather than listening to the science, which you can pick whatever facts you want and shop for an expert to support your convenient opinion, conveniently support you, uh, and the agenda is not clear. When we just ask, what are the facts? You'll choose those facts, but the agenda is not clear. And I think if we take this engineering viewpoint, uh, it's a better way to frame the discussion because the objective has to be clear. It was the first thing we had to talk about is what are we maximizing? And uh, so I think if we frame it as an engineering discussion, we may have better luck in um, forcing, forcing citizens and forcing uh, our leaders to be explicit about their goals. Uh, so with that, I'll stop and we can have questions. All right, yeah, thank you so much, Blake. I love this presentation. I love this tool. Um, I think it is so valuable um, that it is so, so needed for people to understand um, what's really going on economically while we let this virus sort of rule the roost, so to speak, rather than take control of it and clean it up efficiently. So let's see if there are some questions that we can pull from the chat. You can also look through the chat and, and pull ones that you'd like to respond to while I do the same. Um, yeah, that, that's great. I think there's quite a lot that we should. We I should. know, it's a hot topic. <laughs> yeah, so we should both take a look and uh, raise questions. Uh, I'm gonna put my website in here because I do post things. And, and so there was one question, where can we follow this work? Um, yeah. I'll put my site and then um, ncoronavirus.org. Yeah, folks are, um, I'm making it so folks are able to unmute themselves. So if somebody would like to um, unmute themselves and ask a question directly to, to Blake, uh, feel free to go ahead. Ooh, okay, so we'll have three sources. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in my own experience. Eugenia or Sharu? Yes, um, Blake, thank you so much for that brilliant presentation. Um, we are here, we're motivated, and we're seeing your numbers, and we're listening to the explanation that you give and you understand the numbers, what would be the easiest way to translate this information to our local governments? Because I think this, this is a deal breaker. I mean, they need to understand that it's not lives versus economy. It, it, it just goes together. There's no economy if, we, if everybody dies. <laughs> so um, how, how do we get that? that information to them like because it's it's a concept that is not easy and even if we are here and we're motivated and it's like it's a little bit hard to just keep up with the data and you are probably the one who knows more the data and 
and who can present that at the best. So how can us bring that information? It's like it's going to be a bit hard yeah. to. That's a good question. Yeah, Eugenia would like to know um, how do we get this information in front of the, the governmental leaders that really should listen to this? And so, yeah, this, this is the perfect question. Um, I, I, have, I have good news and bad news. Um, the bad news is I have your same question actually um, i've i've been asking this to myself and uh, i think we're all a lot of us asking it to ourselves how do we and and so so yeah the, the bad news i don't have a great answer i think the good news this is much more popular of a viewpoint than it has been say six months ago or, or nine months ago um you know i think so yeah early march even Janir and myself you know we were writing these articles you know stay home for a month, you'll be finished a month. And so that's, that's an important thing to understand is that a month is enough or six weeks or something. Um, and, and so I think that's starting to catch on. You know, we had a lot of talks the past couple of days where it really is just catching on. And, and we're now having conferences like this where, um, where people are coming together. Um, and, and so, you know, I think I'm always happy to yeah, I'm always happy to present the work to local leaders. I think it works with the community. When the citizens in the community want something, then the leaders ha like have to act. When the people, I mean, they don't have to, but you definitely need the citizens on board. What happens is that the people fight each other, right? When they And then I'm not going to say that it's, yeah, I, I think there's enough confusion around that when the people fight each other, when the neighbor fights their, their own neighbor, then nothing happens. Because then the leader is stuck. The leader doesn't even know what to do because right, they're thinking about popularity. So I think the first step is that we at least agree in ourselves. And I think the smaller place actually is better. Um, you know, you look at these developed nations and developed nations have done some of the worst at this pandemic. And, and um, but it's when the people care about each other and, and communities come together. And so I think a small community is actually better because there may not be as much scientific knowledge, but as I said, the science, it's, it's a tricky business. Uh, knowing, knowing half of science is actually dangerous because then you start getting tricked into things when people start to sell you stuff. So it's actually, if people are, are simple, if people are just you know, thinking about their own business, thinking about their own livelihood and caring for each other, uh, then I think the argument can be made. And I think it's actually harder when people get uh, too fancy sometimes. Uh, and so, you know, you talked about, I know the data very well. I actually presented very little data in this. I didn't have to look at so many numbers. I just picked out the five most important things and, and that's enough. So I think, I think it's within reach. <laughs> but why don't yeah. we look at uh, what, else, what else we should talk about? So we actually are um, on schedule to end at 325. So we have a little bit less than five minutes. So I'd love to just take one more question um, from the audience here. Um, Noel, would you like to um, unmute and share your, your thoughts? Uh, sure. I had a few different ones in that chat, which might have been slightly off topic. Was there one in particular that caught your eye? Um. I just, well, go ahead with whatever you, is at the top of your head. I was just going to say, um, I think that this sort of modeling and making it really accessible to people is incredible and really important. And on, you know, the outreach side, as much as we could do to, you know, inspire letter writing campaigns or petitions, you know, mass signature work for very local governments, I think would be really helpful. Um, but from an economic and a modeling standpoint, do you know if there's any work yet um, on trying to include morbidity long-term as well as mortality into the equation? I see. So, so it, it definitely needs to be part of the equation. Um, it needs to be part of it for a few reasons. Um, you know, I, I think what, what I liked about doing it this way just as a starting point is that even like, even when we didn't account for that, you still get this answer that you should lock down. And, and so I think that what, you know, when we start adding in long COVID, we start adding in 
asymptomatic carriers who still experience, you know, long-term, um, yeah, long-term health uh, detriments. That that sort of just adds fuel to this argument of you should lock down more. And and so what I tried to do here actually is to strip things away, right? Just pretend that long COVID doesn't exist. Fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, right. So I think that like, to some extent, we should be doing that actually, play the devil's advocate and say that you still, because because when it's the simpler it is, then it's also more understandable. And that, okay, but that said, right, so where, where this becomes relevant, actually, is in this vaccination thing. Because I had those slides at the end where it was like, well, as more people are vaccinated, you actually can reopen some and you can start sacrificing a few people. And that's a dangerous game to play. And that's where I said it starts, now you have a real trolley problem. Uh, so I think that's where it comes in the equation and we need to do more work there because people will argue, hey, we have a vaccine. Uh, why are you, get out of my office, <laughs> okay? We have a vaccine, we're done. And it's like, well, no, no for a few reasons. Uh, are we gonna need a new vaccine every year as new strains arise and so forth? Well, you know, so that, that might happen. Uh, you can't even vaccinate enough people in one year for it to for it to go away. So, uh, there, you know, and, and then so on top of that, the people who you're eventually vaccinating next year, they get it right now, and they actually have long-term symptoms. So, so these are where the long COVID starts. I would say starts to matter. And so, yes, we should. Um, yeah, we and yes, we should add that. Well, thank you so much, Blake. Um, it is 325, so we do have to break now. We do have our final session coming up. I'd like to thank, thank you, Blake, Olga, and Leela for presenting today. I hope everyone was able to get um, in the chat uh, the links for future, um, you know, if you want to look back on, on this model with Blake or the, um, the maps that Leela and Olga put forward. They are on our end coronavirus website. So um, great work, um, super helpful. Um, and we will see you all at the next session in, I think, it be I believe it starts in 10 minutes. If that's, up, if that's right, Kim. <laughs> yeah. What I'll do actually, and maybe the other speakers, if we can head over to the Slack channel and I'm happy to continue discussing um, if, if everyone's in Slack. And then I've also put my email, so I'd be happy to take any follow-up uh, by email. Um, and I think that goes, I think I can speak for my colleagues, uh, Layla and Olha, you know, you can always email us and we're, we're always happy to, uh, yeah, we're always happy to, to discuss things. Okay. Yeah, All right. Thanks. Bye.